Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Art George. Um, I, uh, a little bit about my background. I was a lawyer for uh, when I was had a regular job. Uh, I was able to retire uh, a, a little early. Um, but while I was a lawyer, I was a writer. I wrote a history book about Russia and a, and a mythology book about the Garden of Eden story. And, and now I have this uh, one about the holidays. And I have another one coming out uh, about a month from now about the mythology of wine. You know, that's the book there uh, about the holidays. And today's talk is uh, based on the Halloween chapter from that book. So I think I can uh, share that now. The, I have a PowerPoint slides uh, presentation. It's about 35 uh, slides and it'll take about 35, 38 minutes, something like that. And then after, we, after that, we can uh, talk. Okay, uh, as I said, this is uh, based on my book and it's called The Mythology of America's Seasonal Holidays, The Dance of the Hore. And I included, uh, the reason why I included the Hore in the title of the book and uh, the illustration on the front cover, um, the Hore meant the seasons personified by goddesses. Um, since in Greece, there were three seasons of spring, summer, and autumn, and there were three hore, uh, th thalo, oxo, and carpo, and they're corresponding to the seasons. And they were said to quote unquote, dance their way through the seasons, hence my book's subtitle. As Ph Philostratus described it, quote, the hore coming to earth in their own proper forms with clasped hands are dancing the year through its course. How they sing, how they whirl in the dance. Their importance for my book is that what each of them symbolized, even their names, evolved and transformed over time. Originally symbolizing nature and agriculture, as Greece became more urbanized and philosophical, the hore came to represent abstract principles. Likewise, our own seasonal holidays evolved from a preoccupation with agriculture and husbandry to concerns more typical of a modern society as well as those of versions of the Christian religion. Halloween is our most confusing holiday. On the one hand, we have images of harvest and fertility, such as corn, pumpkins, squash, bobbing for apples. And on the other hand, we have images of death, autumn leaves, skeletons, ghosts, gravestones, and the dead rising from their graves in Michael Jackson's thriller. Also, children and adults celebrate in different ways. Costumes have no coherent theme. No longer tied to any particular tradition, Halloween is celebrated universally across the population, regardless of age, gender, religion, nationality, ethnicity, or political affiliation. To help unravel this, I'll be going through the traditions outlined on the slide. One qualification, however, Many countries and cultures have festivals of the dead. It's nearly universal. One famous example is the Mexican Day of the Dead, but it was not part of the evolution of Halloween. So here I'm only gonna cover the festivals which influenced the development of Halloween. We can start with the ancient world in ancient Greece where they had a festival called the Anthesteria. Uh, it was a three-day festival and it was basically, a, in origin, a festival of the dead. Uh, they started by opening these pithoi, uh, which are used for both wine and for uh, uh, burials. And originally, um, as I said, burials, and uh, when they opened them on the first day of the festival, the spirits of the dead were thought to uh, emerge, much like from Pandora's jar. And presiding over the festival was the god of Hermes, who's a messenger to the underworld and an intermediary to the spirits of the dead, called Keres, and he could control them. On the second day, people made offerings to Hermes, and people chewed, uh, took apotropaic measures to protect themselves from the, from the spirits who could be harmful. And then on the third day, they were dismissed uh, with the saying, Be gone, you Keres, the Anthesteria is over. And the, the festival uh, was a kind of a cleansing of the city, and then life could uh, return to normal. And over time, it became a drinking festival with Dionysus uh, presiding, but that's another subject. In Rome, 
they had two festivals of the dead. Uh, the first was in February, just before the New Year, because New Year was on March 1st uh, originally. Uh, and the idea, again, was purification and setting things right before the New Year. And it had both public and private aspects. Uh, in the public, there was a Vestal Virgin who performed rituals in honor of the dead, and then a ceremony called the Feralia, where people carried gifts to the tombs of their ancestors. Uh, on the same day, uh, an old hag, a witch-like character, performed dark rites uh, designed to shut the mouths of the dead spirits and, and, and protect the population. The family rite uh, was a family reunion devoted to honoring the living kin and renewing ties and pitching up, patching up old quarrels. There was a potluck family meal, uh, which probably was originally a, a, a funereal feast. The second Roman holiday, uh, again, was over three days, and uh, like the, the Greek festival. Um, and it was named after the Lemuris, who are the ghosts of the dead. And again, private and public rituals, but we only know the private one. And this involved the, the head of the uh, household getting up in the middle of the night barefoot, and he would throw black beans over his shoulder, saying, these I send, with these beans I redeem me and mine. And he did it nine times after which the Lemuris were appeased uh, and uh, after partaking of the beans. And then the household, uh, head of the household would touch water, bang some bronze implements to drive the Lemuris away, uh, reciting, ghost of my fathers be gone, and then he could look back. Uh, because of this festival, Romans were cautious and didn't do anything important in May, and including marriages, which is what led to our own tradition of June marriages. Uh, now we can move to the Christian uh, history uh, of this. Uh, early Christians honored their martyrs, uh, and they did so on the anniversaries of their deaths. But after, after a while, the number of martyrs increased, and it was really impractical to do it every time for each martyr. So what they started doing is celebrating uh, the, all martyrs in one day of the year, which was on May 13th to begin with, which happened to be the last day of the Lemuria festival that I just talked about. So here's another case of where the, the, the Christians were adopting the pagan uh, holidays and you know sites and so forth uh, to turn it into Christian. And uh, eventually, uh, this festival came to be celebrated in Northern Europe uh, on November 1st. And that happens to be the date of the Celtic uh, sowing uh, festival, which I'll get to later. Uh, and Pope Gregory IV uh, established this formally, although it took a while in all areas for the, the date to uh, be celebrated uh, at the same time. Now, uh, the history of these holidays, the Christian holidays, uh, conforms to the general policy of, of, of the Christian church of uh, trying to take over the or eliminate the, uh, the pagan uh, temples, rituals, holidays, beliefs, uh, deities, and so forth. Um, and it was set forth in a famous letter uh, of Gregory the Great. Uh, and here, you, as you can see, you can read it for yourself. Uh, he specifically mentions uh, the festival of the holy martyrs uh, in this connection. So uh, these holidays were part of that strategy. Well, important here is the doctrine of purgatory, which I'll review just briefly. Uh, it's rooted in early Christianity when people were praying for the souls of uh, the dead and the living, for that matter, too. Uh, it was adopted at ch as church doctrine only in 1245. And the idea was that the souls of the people who had committed only venal rather than mortal sins uh, would spend a period in purgatory to have their souls cleansed, uh, and at which point they could enter heaven. So what people did was they, they would pray to God for the dead souls that were uh, in purgatory to help get them through. Likewise, uh, they would pray to the saints for their intervention on behalf of the dead souls. So it was a two-pronged approach, and that's reflected in the two holidays. So All Saints Day, November 1st, um, or eventually November 1st, 
uh, soon went beyond honoring just the saints. Uh, the church developed a doctrine called the communion of saints, which, which in included the union of all members of the church, including uh, the dead people and their souls. And this is important because it breaks down the barriers between earth and supernatural realm and also implies uh, a connection or communication between the living and the dead. So All Souls Day, which is November 2nd, uh, was established and that was meant to honor and come to terms with the souls of the dead friends and relatives, uh, especially if their death was recent. And it, it started in the Middle Ages and uh, it was established on November 2nd uh, uh, by an abbot. And that custom too spread across. So we have All Saints Day where you're praying for the saints to intervene on the on behalf of the souls of the dead. And then we have All Souls Day the next day where you're doing it uh, directly to God. And it spread all the way to around the world, like here's uh, just a couple of years ago in India where there are you know, candles uh, uh, representing the, the souls. Now, the, the church took a third step, uh, which was to establish a liturgy on the evening of October 31st, which is the Eve of All Saints Day. And that was known as All Hallows Eve, uh, which means All Saints Eve. And this was kind of a getting going about uh, praying for the saints to intercede on behalf of the souls in purgatory. And hollow means saint or sacred. And the Scottish name for All Saints Eve, All Hallow Even, is eventually what developed into Halloween, the, the word we have today. And it still means, uh, in its meaning, Saints Eve or, or Sacred Eve. So the, the, the tritium of, of these three events, uh, the Eve, the day, and, and, and All Souls Day is known as All Hallow Tide. So with that, uh, we can turn to the, to the pagan side, uh, the Celtic festival of Samhain. Um, it, the, the, the days began in the evening. It's, it's like the, in, in Judaism. Uh, so, uh, uh, and it was celebrated on the, the new moon closest to our evening uh, of, of uh, October 31st. And it was a three day festival, uh, just like all Hallow Tide uh, became. And uh, in this process, uh, as, uh, as time went on, Irish clerics were influential in the church and they <clears throat> played an important role in setting the dates of All Hallow, All Hallow Tide to coincide and co-opt the pagan festival in accordance with the usual uh, policy that I described. So it's important to understand the pre-Christian Soan tradition in order to identify which parts of the original tradition uh, survived in Halloween. Uh, November 1st uh, was considered the new year uh, for these people. Uh, so it was, a, it was an occasion for renewal. And uh, if we can summarize the festival down to its essentials, uh, what it was, uh, was a festival that utilized the occasion of the new year to achieve the regeneration of individuals, their kings, and society through interaction with the powers and beings of the other world. It was a festival of transformation celebrated through myths, rituals about the other, other world. And the key myths in uh, this culture, the action in those myths occurred on the, at the time of sowing. So it was very pertinent. The main rituals in the festival, uh, I'll talk about a few other ones later, but the main ones were uh, the communal bonfire, a feast, and drinking to intoxication. And all three of these rituals were, were thought to be transformational. To understand this, uh, we need to understand what, what for these people the other world meant. Uh, for them, uh, there were two realms in reality, the, the normal surface world of the living, and then everything else, which was called the other world. And it, it wasn't far away in heaven or anything like that. It, it was uh, just under the surface of the earth, just a few feet, uh, magical islands, bottoms of lake, uh, maybe in the sea, some, some far away places. Uh, but it was relatively close. And it had inhabitants. The beings of the other world, there's a whole mythology which is too long to get into, but they were most, mostly former humans, but now, uh, now they were supernatural and immortal. And they actually looked like people and they had the same virtues and vices as humans, but they were not 
bad, bad spirits. Um, they were mostly helpful and they weren't really spirits of the dead. They were, they were alive. Um, and there were portals in and out of the other world, uh, fairy mounds or, or, or Shea as they're called. And because it was a new year, it was a liminal time where the, the barriers to the, the usual world and the other world were, were, were thin. And not, not, not just thin, but actually open, because they're, they're like doors. And uh, so this made the other world accessible uh, to, to humans, and, uh, and also the, the residents of the other world could come out into the, uh, the, the everyday world as well. OK, so to go through the rituals, we'll start with the bonfire. Um, on that eve, the fires around the land uh, were extinguished. And uh, that, so that's the old year going out. And new ones were lit, uh, particularly a communal, communal bonfire in each, uh, each location, in each town or so forth. Um, people differ about how these originated. Uh, there's a practical explanation, which they were accumulating. They were just burning the refuse from the summer activity and getting rid of it before the new year. Uh, other people think the fire is imitative of the sun, urging it to stay and uh, not, not go away, which is an exercise in uh, sympathetic magic. And then there's the idea that it's for protection to scare evil spirits. But as I just mentioned, the people from the, 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 the beings from the other world were not evil, okay? So this, is, uh, this, this notion uh, came around only with Christianity, so it's a, really a Christian uh, anachronism. My own view, is that the bonfire was an agent for transformation, especially for kings. And I base this on uh, the mythology of fire in general, the Celtic myths involving fire, and uh, so in being the new year, which brings in the usual New Year's uh, mythology. Psychologically, light refers to consciousness, especially uh, when unconscious content becomes conscious. So this is like the other world coming into one's uh, conscious world, normal world. Um, generally, a fire is a purging agent. It eliminates the old, makes way for the new. Uh, for the Celts, uh, fire was not a primordial element, but it was an agency of transformation. It transforms the other elements. So this is unlike Greece. And the New Year's mythology uh, generally worldwide is typically about transformation and renewal. Uh, and this is true for both gods and humans. Uh, oops, just a minute. Yeah. Um, the, the myths, the, uh, the so in myths involving fire show this. Uh, one was called the intoxication of the Ulsterman. And here the hero uh, Kukulain and his companions are at a feast on Soen, hosted by their enemies, the king and queen of Connacht. And after uh, the Coquelin and his companions were filled with uh, food and drink, they were imprisoned in an iron house, and a fire was started around it with the intention of roasting them alive. Coquelin's companions then blamed him for their plight. But Coquelin executes a, a powerful jump and breaks the structure apart, which enables them to escape. After that, Conant's king was apologetic and hosted them to another feast in a wooden house. During the feast, challenged by his companions, Kukulain then executes another jump, known as the Leap of the Salmon, in which he breaks through the roof of the house, proving that he's now better than ever. The lesson's clear. Kukulain has emerged from the trial by fire in supreme shape, better than the king of Conant and trusted by his men. Another, another myth is, is similar, and, and this involves King Matalich of Ireland. He was visited by a large red-haired man and his wife, both from the other world. These, these visitors began to commit various offenses, and to get rid of them, the king's vassals put them inside an iron house that they had built, and fires were set around it to incinerate them, like in the prior myth. When it got too hot, the red-haired man gave the house a blow with his shoulder and cast it aside. But now, learning his lesson, he was gracious to the king. And he presented the king with a magic cauldron, which he had brought with him on his journey. And the cauldron would restore to life the dead that are placed within it. So there seems to be a parallel between iron houses and the cauldron. 
both of which can transform people, even from the other world, in the presence of fire. And this is what brings us to the magic of the feast, which parallels that of the fire. The, uh, the food that was the focus of the feast was pork. And pigs were very prominent in the other world, and, and there were a lot of myths in, in involving them. Um, they were eaten by gods to retain their imp immortality. And uh, the pigs themselves were immortal. Uh, the Dagda's pigs were, and uh, the pigs of uh, Madaman Maklir and the king of uh, uh, Tuata Danan, the Danan. So the Celts associated pigs with the other world, and eating them, eating them would put one in touch with the other world and would help gain one immortality in the afterlife. So this was transformational food. Now the pork was not roasted on the fire like you might think, but it was braised or broiled in, a, in the cauldron. And we see a lot of archeological finds uh, uh, involving cauldrons. Uh, so we know that the people did this. And the, the cauldron had magical qualities, as we've just seen. It gives knowledge and perception and can revive the dead. And they're prominent in a number of the Celtic myths, which explain their, their transformational function. Uh, in a simple case, the Dagda had a, a cauldron and, and it satisfies any way, anyone, uh, and it's analogous to a horn of, of plenty. Um, in another myth, uh, someone g gains uh, supernatural knowledge from just taking three drops of a potion that's boiled in the cauldron. In another situation, uh, the Irish, uh, with a cauldron that revives the dead, have the advantage in a, in a battle until the Welsh destroy it. Uh, in Peridor, uh, the, the cauldron actually revives a, course, a corpse. And I, as we just saw in the case of uh, King Mathewich, uh, that that cauldron also restores uh, life to the dead. And an example of what is going on here appears to occur in the famous uh, Gundestrup cauldron. If you look at the bottom, these are dead or inj in injured soldiers. And one by one, this deity on the left is dipping uh, the, the soldier into a cauldron that revives him. And then once revived, they're able to ride off on horses up along the top there. And so that's the majority uh, interpretation of that. It's, it's not, uh, it's not 100%. And then finally, the, the, the third main ritual was intoxication through transformational drink. Um, as I say in my wine mythology book that'll be out shortly, uh, the idea here was people didn't really understand how fermentation worked. Uh, or why you have this intoxication when you drink uh, such drinks. So they, they thought it was uh, a divine force. Uh, there, there, was, there, was, there was a supernatural drink. And therefore, uh, gods would, were said to drink the uh, intoxicating drinks. And uh, mead was the drink of the Celtic gods. And so that was the most common uh, beverage uh, at Soan. And actually, the, if you look at the Celtic myths, uh, the ones which uh, involve intoxication are the ones that are said to occur, uh, take place, the action uh, during so on. Okay, a few other minor things that happened at so on. Um, they also practice divination. And that's because uh, during so on, it was a liminal time. You have access to the other world. So logically, it, it makes sense to, uh, divine things and see in the future at, at that time. Uh, the ritual involved the bonfire, uh, where you would toss stones into the fire or place them around it, and then the next morning you'd look at the positions and, and, and divine. Uh, and the, the, these divination rituals did carry over into Halloween, as I'll, I'll show in a, in a minute. Uh, another thing that happened, there was the, the poets would re recite poets and, and tell myths and, and, and some people think that the myths were also reenacted uh, at the time around the bonfire. Now, one, one important point is that there's no evidence of a cult of dead ancestors on, on so on. It was an event for the living to regenerate them. Okay, now we can uh, start to call, talk about Halloween. Uh, 
here it's like in ancient Greece, like I talked before in connection with the Hore, uh, a difference between rural areas and urban areas. Uh, in the rural areas, the bonfire, the divination rituals, the feast, drinking, all of that continued. But a lot of it was transformed in a Christian sense. So now the, there was the fire represented souls in purgatory being cleansed uh, before they, they could go on to heaven, for example. In urban areas, however, uh, the fire and the divination uh, was inside, indoors, in the fireplace, at home. Uh, and you still had a big meal, but maybe, but not this intoxication thing that you had in, in the original uh, sewing. And the imagery of the supernatural beings that come out on the evening of uh, October 31st changed. Instead of these other world people, the fairies, if you will, that act like normal people, uh, in, under the Christian influence, they were demonized and thought of as evil spirits. And also from All Souls, Souls Day, the idea that the restless spirits of the dead were active on this eve also developed, and they had to be appeased through offerings at the doorstep or on the hearth. And uh, in, in the countryside, uh, where the feast, feast ritual continued, one interesting part of it evolved into a sporting event where uh, the uh, people in towns or maybe two adjoining town, uh, nearby towns, uh, they, would, they would have a contest. And they, what they would do is they'd take a ball and try and carry it across some goal line or, or maybe to the next town. So it was back and forth, almost like a tug of war. And the ball was made out of pig's bladder. Uh, they st stitched it up you know, the night before or whatever. And uh, <clears throat> that is interesting because of the pork being a uh, part of the feast. And uh, so anyway, uh, a lot of people think that that's how our football uh, was made out of a pigskin from that tradition and why football season is in the fall. Here's an illustration of the urban side. Uh, this is probably uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, and here we have the fire indoors, uh, and a young lady there is seen throwing something into the fire. It's an exercise in divination, and typically that would be about her future marriage. Uh, another ritual that developed uh, was that called souling, uh, and this uh, was a ritual where the more well-off people would bake soul cakes and then the poorer people would go around town going from door to door and they would ask for the food, usually the soul cakes. And in exchange for the food, they would agree to, to uh, recite prayers on, the be on behalf of the dead ancestors of the, of the, of the people who gave up the food. Uh, so you can see there a, a, a precedent for the uh, trick or treat. Another precedent for trick or treat was a, a practice called guising. And this is mostly young men uh, going around town as well. Uh, they were in costumes and uh, there are various reasons why they might've done that. One is uh, to avoid being recognized uh, by dead, dead ancestors uh, so they can't be harmed. Maybe to scare away the uh, evil, uh, evil spirits. Uh, it's an exercise in sympathetic magic. If you dress like the thing that you're uh, trying to save yourself from, then you're, it's neutral, it is neutralized. And then as time went on, the spirits were not taken so seriously, it became more of a parody. Anyway, the geysers themselves also went from house to house asking for money. It wasn't so much soul cakes, but it was asking for money, food, wood contributions for the, the bonfire and, and, and so forth. And given that these people were dressed as evil spirits, it was a logical development for them to start playing pranks. Uh, and uh, so if people were stingy and, and not giving them very much, they might play pranks on them or uh, taking a longer view, they might be doing some rough justice uh, to uncooperative villagers generally. And, and, uh, and, and these were serious pranks. I mean, you would take people's gates off the barn, you know, take a barn door off the barn, uh, put a wagon on a roof. I mean, it, it's uh, a lot more serious stuff than uh, what trick-or-treaters uh, these days do. Okay, um, we also had uh, 
lanterns carried around on Halloween. Uh, they were made out of turnips and other root vegetables, uh, and they were carried by the geyser, geysers, and they were also placed in the windows of the homes to protect against the uh, evil spirits. And they, they, they themselves re represented the grotesque faces of the evil spirits and were tend to s intended to scare them off because, it was again, it was an exercise in uh, sympathetic magic. Pumpkins were not used because they were not native. Uh, they were native only to uh, North America. So we only got pumpkin uh, jack-o'-lanterns uh, once, uh, once Halloween came here. <clears throat> now the jack in jack-o'-lantern comes from uh, another legend, which I'll get to in a moment. But first I want to show you an example of the uh, turnip jack-o'-lantern. You can see it's carved in there. And then we come to the, the jack. Um, according to this legend, there was this stingy, sly, not very nice guy named Jack. And one day he was in the bar and the devil came up to him. And, uh, and uh, Jack said to the devil, buy me a drink. And the devil turned himself into a coin and he got into Jack's pocket. But in Jack's pocket was a cross. And so the devil couldn't get out of the pocket because of the cross. And so they made a deal that Jack would let the devil back out if the devil wouldn't come after his soul for 10 years. So the 10 years came and went. Jack was walking down a country road. The devil comes up, say, okay, it's time. I want your soul. Jack says, okay, but look, I, there's an apple tree right next to us here, and I would like an apple to eat it before we go. So the, the devil says, okay. So he goes up the tree to get the apple, and Jack carves a cross on the trunk of the tree. So it's the same thing. Uh, the devil can't get down. So they make a deal, and this time, the, de the, the uh, devil agrees never to come for his soul. So in due time, uh, Jack dies and he goes to the pearly gates and Paul doesn't let him in because Jack had led a bad life. So instead, Jack goes over to the, the gates of hell and the devil says, no, you can't get in here because I promise never to take your soul. But what the devil did do is give him a glowing ember from the fires of hell. Meant, and this was meant to light his way at night or whatever. And so Jack took that and put it inside one of those turnip lanterns that I talked about. And so that's how we get Jack a lantern. It meant Jack was known as Jack of the Lantern, and the, uh, the, the turnip was likewise so called, and it was shortened to Jack o' lantern. So that is how we got Jack o' lanterns. Um, so it came to America. Uh, at first, as we all know, the Puritans settled uh, the Northeast to start with, so Halloween didn't come here fast. It took until the late 19th century when we had mass immigration uh, from Ireland and Scotland, where, where Halloween was, was strongest. And then it spread to the rest of the country uh, and to other people uh, from there. And today it's just celebrated universally, as I, I said at the beginning, across the population. At this point now, we can, we can go over the legacies of all Holotide and sewing, uh, sewing that uh, did and did not make their way into Halloween. Uh, the contact with the other world in, in, in its own way uh, survives in Halloween. Uh, likewise with the, ga the guising, uh, that, that's trick or treat. Uh, and also with adults at costume parties, we have the jack-o'-lanterns um, and the pranks. Rituals that didn't survive uh, were the bonfires, although they are celebrated in sewing revival celebrations that we see uh, around. Uh, the feast as such is not celebrated, but the, uh, the ball game is. And uh, di the divination part has not survived. The part about the, uh, the poets reciting poems and and tell, retelling the myths is kind of replicated in the, the many Halloween films and music videos that we have uh, uh, in, in our day. And also we have Halloween parades and processions, uh, which are relatively new. 
Okay, um, just a couple more slides. Um, so we can start to summarize here. Uh, the modern holiday preserves the original Soen notion of personal transformation in the course of this magical evening, but not in the same way. And this is not surprising because the uh, mythologist Joseph Campbell said that Halloween is based on archetypal structures within our psyche that underlie our spiritual life and produce psychic balance, which is what myth is, it involves. Uh, our psyche refuses to erect a permanent barrier between the profane and the sacred, our world and the other world. The rituals of Halloween are reflections of what transpires within our psyches. For children, Halloween helps them to come to terms with frightening images and characters in dreams. Likewise, it can help adults deal with nightmares. Halloween allows people to act out their sublimated fantasies. And in our constrained lives, the rebellious, transgressive aspect of Halloween can be healthy. Also, Halloween can help deal with death. Mocking it can be a willful defense against the unacceptable, but merely making it visible is still one path to coming to terms with it. Our own holidays, the other holidays have become rather mundane, domesticated, institutionalized, and constricted, but Halloween still allows us our freedom and creativity. And it's the only remaining major American holiday where people young and old can celebrate by taking on alternative roles that exercise their imagination and potential for creative expression and fantasy. It therefore, conserves, serves an important mythological, creative, and psychological purpose. And then the final slide, uh, things that one can do, final thoughts. Well, there are modern re revivals of so on, so you can always go to one of those uh, in America and, uh, and abroad, mainly in Celtic uh, countries with Celtic traditions. We, we should remember that the festival was originally transformational, and a proactive psychological awareness of the rituals helps us make them so today. It can still be sacred without spoiling the fun. I would urge to read the myths. Uh, I talked about some of them in my talk. Uh, there are comp compilations available. Finally, as we go through our Halloween rituals, remember what they once were. When you give Halloween candy to children, remember that it was once done to save souls. When you see pranks, remember that they used to be worse. And remember that the other world beings were once helpful. They're still inside us, and they can be so again. Thank you.